Will you pray with me? And they said unto him, Sir, we would see Jesus. By your Holy Spirit, we pray so this morning. In his name. Amen. The year is 1858. A young 34-year-old French acrobat by the name of Charles Blondin set out to be the first person to do something that no one else had ever done. He wanted to cross the boiling cataract, that being the Niagara Falls, on a tightrope. Now, Charles Blondin believed that there was no need for a safety net, believing that preparing for disaster only made it more likely to happen. And so, in 1858, in the summer, a rope of uh, 1,300 feet long and just two inches wide, made completely of hemp, was stretched from America to Canada across the falls. It was a windy week and crowds had gathered, 25,000 to be precise, but no, it was too windy to cross until June the 30th, a still morning. And the crowd massed on the American side and the crowd massed on the Canadian side. They were enthusiastic. They were taking bets on whether he would make it or plunge to his death below. So, slowly but surely, Charles Blondin started to edge across on the tightrope just with his balancing stick. And he got to the middle. But it sagged rather close to the falls in the middle, and then he started to jump up and down. And then he crossed, finally, to the other side. The crowds went wild. They were cheering, they were hollering. And then he said, do you think I can do it again? Yes, they said. And back he went. And again, he gets to the middle and he starts jumping up and down and they're holding their breath. And then he walks to the other side, back to America. Then he says, do you think I can do it with a wheelbarrow? Uh -huh. Yes, they say, absolutely. So then he goes, starts out again. And he gets to that sagging middle and jumps up and down and goes across to Canada. But this time he just turns around and goes back immediately to America. The crowd are getting bananas. They're roaring like crazy. Then he says, do you think I can do it again with someone in the wheelbarrow? <laughs> yes, they say, absolutely. Okay, who's coming with me? Absolute silence. <laughs> There is a fine line, my friends, between the human psyche of doubt and trust. In the Peanuts comic strip, Charlie Brown, Charlie Brown is talking to his friend Lucy as they walk home on the last day of school. And Charlie Brown says to Lucy, Lucy, I got straight A's. Ain't that great? Lucy, in her rather typical fashion, shoots down poor Charlie Brown and says, I don't believe you, Charlie Brown. Unless we, you show me your report, I won't believe a word of what you say. Well, most of us, I think, can relate to Lucy. After all, seeing is believing. Most people, myself included, have to see something before they believe it. Now, today's Gospel records an incident that is seen nowhere else in the other three Gospels. It is unique to the Gospel of John. Indeed, the disciple in question, Thomas, appears uniquely three times in the Gospel of John. And I want to just mention the two previous occasions in the Gospel of John where we come across Thomas. The first is when Lazarus falls ill. And you remember that they proclaim that Lazarus has died. 
Lazarus is Jesus' friend and he wants to go to Lazarus and his family. But the disciples of Jesus warn him that returning to Bethany in Judea is dangerous. And so we read in chapter 11, they say, but Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you want to go back there? Then, one disciple, just one, Thomas, says this, let us go that we may die with him. In other words, incredible courage. He's putting his trust in Jesus. This is really almost not even the midway point in Jesus' ministry. There's something in Thomas that has great courage. The second encounter we see with Thomas is a bit later in John chapter 14. And Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he says to them, you know the way, the place where I am going. And you can imagine them all nodding their heads. But again, it's only Thomas who's brave enough to put his hand up and actually say what the others are really thinking, which is, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And that, of course, elicits those famous words of Jesus. I am the way the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So we see Thomas first as someone who is courageous, courageous in the face of possible death. We see Thomas as someone who is willing to speak out, who's honest and desires to know the truth. But Thomas isn't attributed with either of these qualities. No, if you look at characters in the Bible, you have Samson and his hair, you have Joseph with his amazing technicolor dream coat, you have Jonah with his whale, John, of course, is the baptizer, Judas is the betrayer, and Thomas, Thomas is the doubter. The New Testament, in fact, gives him several names. Thomas the Apostle. It also gives him his full name, Judas Thomas. Not a very fortunate first name, but there we are. His name is Judas Thomas. But he's got a nickname as well. He's known as Didymus, or the twin. But none of those have stuck over the years. We don't talk about Thomas the Apostle, or Judas Thomas, or Didymus. No, we talk about Doubting Thomas. It's that name that has stuck. When I was at boarding school, we had a, a, a swimming master. He was in charge of swimming. But he was famous for giving everyone their nickname in your first term at school. And whatever you were given was the name that you would have from the age of 10 to 18. Mine was Beached Whale. <laughs> there were worse, there were worse. My friend was Tubby Woo. So there we are. <laughs> Poor Thomas, Doubting Thomas. But let me be clear, doubt is not the same as unbelief. You see, doubt is when you want to believe, but you're not sure you're quite able to. Doubt is when you want to believe, but you're not quite sure you're able to. And doubt comes to us when we reach the limits of our understanding. We cannot quite figure out in our mind what God is up to. When life's twists and turns make no sense, maybe a sudden and unexpected calamity, or maybe we pray for something and the complete opposite seems to happen, or we do what is right and suffer miserably for it. Now, to be clear, all the disciples had doubts. Jesus had been the Messiah after all, but he was dead. They saw it with his own eyes. He was crucified. And what about this kingdom of God he spoke about? There was no kingdom. The king himself was dead. Was he God's son? Or merely a fake? Had he fooled and taken them in? Now sure, Mary had said that she'd seen the risen Christ, but who could believe the testimony of a woman? 
and more than that, a former prostitute. And sure, Peter and John had seen the empty tomb and the grave clothes lying there, but where was Jesus? Notice, as we begin our Gospel, that in verse 19, the disciples were together behind closed doors for fear of the Jews. But only one was missing. Thomas. Thomas was the one who wasn't there the first time that Jesus appears. The disciples were ecstatic. We don't know why Thomas wasn't there, but they wanted to tell him. And so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. The actual translation of telling in this scripture actually says they kept going on about it. You can imagine all week long, poor Thomas kept hearing about this risen Jesus, how he had appeared to them. But Thomas's response is a typical response to the resurrection that many people have today. He demands proof. Now, Thomas, remember, has shared the last three years of his life with these men. He knows how Peter is hot-tempered, how James and John are called the sons of thunder, how John is the beloved disciple. But he also knows that just a few days before, they'd all fled the Garden of Gethsemane in fear and terror. They had seen for their own eyes Jesus crucified and dead on the cross and laid in the tomb. But equally, for the last three years, they'd also seen proof that he was something different. They'd seen the sick healed with their own eyes. They'd seen the people who had been born blind see. They'd even seen Lazarus raised from the dead. The list was extensive. And Thomas had been there for it all. He had seen it all, except this one time. This one time, he wasn't there. He'd missed out. How often someone has said to me, Simon, I wish I had your faith. You see, Thomas saw the change in his friends. They were bubbling over with excitement, but he just had to see it for himself. And so it is, a week later, they're all together. Notice that the door is still locked. Despite what Jesus said to the disciples only a week before, they are still timid in their faith. They're still timid about this risen Christ. And Jesus appears once again. But without saying anything or hearing anything, he goes directly to Thomas. You see, Jesus sees and knows the doubts that Thomas has. And he sees ours and knows our doubts. If you look at verse 25 and verse 27, there are four demands of Thomas and there are four commands of Jesus. Let's look at them briefly. Thomas's first demand is that I must see the nail marks in his, Jesus' hand. And Jesus' first command, see my hands. Thomas's second demand is I must put my fingers where the nails were. Jesus' second command, put your fingers here. Thomas's third demand, I must put my hand in his side. Jesus' third command in response to Thomas, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Then Thomas' final and fourth demand, I will not believe. And Jesus' fourth and final command to Thomas, stop doubting and believe. You see, doubt is not negative until it leads us not to believe. You see, this is what Jesus was going on about, what he was warning Thomas about. He was literally saying to Thomas, Thomas, you just need to act not like a person who has no faith. You need to stop and believe. You need to stop, put your doubts aside and believe. A wise priest once said, 
The only way to survive doubt is to believe. And that's the Rubicon, that's the threshold. That in that moment, Thomas crosses in the most profound way. Thomas just doesn't say, oh yes, I believe. No, he says this. Five words that resonate down through the centuries. Thomas replies to Jesus, my Lord and my God. Thomas makes a tremendous declaration of heartfelt faith. Thomas the doubter becomes Thomas the confessor. He is the very first person to call Jesus not just Lord, but also God. To acknowledge Jesus' deity. For a Jew to make such a statement is incredible. To call anyone my Lord and my God was considered blasphemy and punishable by immediate stoning to death. But remember, Thomas is the courageous. Thomas is the one who's not fearful about speaking his mind. And he says, my Lord, you are the master of my life. My God, how could you be anything but the true and living God? In that moment, Thomas has moved from doubt to certainty, from unbelief to belief. But Jesus doesn't just leave it there. No, he goes on and says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. This is the very climax of John's whole gospel. From the first miracle, or sign as John calls it, at the wedding of Cana of Galilee, everything leads up to this point. And then he goes on. This is written that you, you being us, you and me, may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. This is written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. <coughs> Thomas didn't fully comprehend everything, and he certainly had no idea about what lay ahead. It's believed that, G that Thomas went on to preach the good news of Jesus, first in Persia, and then Parthia, and then finally he ended up in India. He preached from AD 58 to AD 72. And tradition holds that whilst he was in Madras, a large and very sharp spear was put right the way through him. It pierced out his back. But he didn't stop preaching. It took him three days to die an excruciating death, but his last words were not words of agony, but the proclamation of the good news. Maybe, my friends, as we come through this Easter time, it's time for some of us here to have the courage to climb into the wheelbarrow of faith. The Christian life can at times seem like walking a tightrope. We may be a little unsure. We may be a little frightened. We may wobble a bit. It can be very scary. But I can assure you, that we're in very good hands, the very best hands, the hands of our Lord and our God, and he alone will see us to the other side. Amen. <laughs>